I think clients are twofold. One is they're trying to be more flexible themselves. And I think they also like the fact that, you know, we're always there. We're always in the background. Business of Architecture, episode 226. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. As a podcast listener, get free instant access to my four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architecture and design professionals. Get rid of the post-it notes and Excel spreadsheets and get real-time insights on the profitability of your firm with a simple, beautiful, and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Say goodbye to undercharging or ending the year wondering where all that profit went. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm. Learn more and get a free trial over at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. On today's episode of the Business of Architecture show, we speak with Ed Bourget, a principal with Psalm Architecture, based in Boston, Massachusetts. Psalm Architecture offers some employee benefits I think you'll find to be very interesting. For instance, they're completely flexible with their office hours when people have to come in and report for duty, and they have unlimited paid vacations. That's right, unlimited paid vacations. So today we talk about some of the challenges and some of the benefits of having a team that isn't necessarily always in the office and how to make that communication happen so the team together can accomplish powerful things. You'll hear about the Monday meeting powwow that ensures projects stay on track, how to ensure teamwork and coordination among people who aren't in the same physical location. Before we hop into today's episode, I wanted to thank the person with the username DNO Flows for leaving a five-star review over on iTunes. DNO Flows says, listening to your podcast has been a great gem for preparing for my MARC application. I love it when you ask a follow-up question to theories or ideologies. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Dan Flo, for uh, leaving that. Really appreciate that. Also, listener Lisa B. said in the following comment, thank you for the Business of Architecture show where you talked about breaking through some of your money beliefs after attending the Tony Robbins event. Now, that would be episode 208 where I talked about that. Lisa continues, it hit a nerve with me and led me to do some digging into my own hidden beliefs about money. I realized how I've been unintentionally getting in my own way of growing my business the way I'd really like. Now that the light bulb has gone off, I'm looking forward to moving full speed ahead instead of driving with one foot on the gas and the other on the brake. Just wanted to say thank you. (laughs) Well, thank you, Lisa, so much for sending that in. I really appreciate it. However, about the same episode, uh, number 208, iTunes user Neil Bij left the following comment on iTunes, did not enjoy the Unlock Your Dormant Potential episode at all. Not helpful, too broad a topic, very preachy. The technical and functional topical episodes are so much better. Okay, so there you have it. Can't please everyone. All I can do is bring you the best content that I feel will help you excel. So if you haven't already left a review on iTunes, I'd absolutely love it. This is how other architects are able to find this information. And as a whole, we can raise up the profession by running profitable and impactful practices. So go over and leave a review, even if you're going to leave a one-star, two-star review, because this show isn't about Enoch Sears getting a bunch of five-star reviews. It's about creating a show that gives you, my listener, massive and incredible value. And I do that by getting your feedback. Also, if you're in the UK or Europe, come join me and Ryan Willard for the launch party of the Business of Architecture podcast in the UK. That's right. So if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know that Architect Ryan Willard has been contributing some interview episodes, and we're going to spin off a UK-specific version of the Business of Architecture podcast, where he's going to interview influential flot leaders over there in the UK. So it turns out our UK friends, cousins across the pond, care about building a profitable and impactful business as much as we do. The launch party is happening on January 22nd, 2018 in the evening, and there's no charge but you do need to apply to get a free ticket because we have limited tickets available. The venue only holds about 200 people. So there will be food there, drink, a panel discussion by some of England's architectural thought leaders. Plus, I'll be there. So don't miss out on this opportunity to meet face-to-face and connect with other members of the Business of Architecture Faithful. If you want to find out more about that and apply to get a ticket to that event, go to businessofarchitecture.co.uk. 
for all the details. All right, so now let's jump into today's interview with architect Ed Bourget. Tell us about yourself and about the firm. Yes, so uh, I'm Ed Bourget. I'm an architect. Uh, I uh, work in Boston, Mass. I've worked most of my career in Boston. I was trained in uh, Europe. I went to the Glasgow School of Art and uh, worked abroad in uh, London, Scotland, and Austria. But um, I spent about 20 years of my career at Burt Hill. Burt Hill was a Northeast regional firm with um, six offices, as well as some, uh, an office in Dubai and an office in India. Um, Bird Hill was acquired in 2010 by um, Stantec, which is a, um, a global company. It's a publicly traded company. And with that purchase, uh, some of us at Bird Hill Boston decided to, um, to move on. We had, we had to stay there for a number of years with non-compete and so forth. But nonetheless, uh, the culture had changed enough at, at the office that um, it no longer sort of uh, suited us. So I, in particular, went to another mid-sized firm in, in the Boston area, Simsmany McKee. And uh, my colleagues who started SOM, Kuslo and uh, Diana Nicholas, um, they broke off along with a few other uh, Burt Hill, ex-Burt Hill members and started SOM. Uh, that was about three years ago. And part of the plan with, with SOM was to attract um, some flexible, young, bright people to the office. And to do that, um, the idea was that there would be sort of a built-in ability uh, for flexibility, for um, people to work remotely, and basically for us to adapt to uh, people's schedules, employee schedules, as opposed to what we were kind of coming from with bigger corporations where everybody adapts to sort of the, the guidelines and needs of the, the corporation or the business, so forth. So with that, um, SOM really has no, uh, no office hours, no set hours. Uh, all of us have the ability to work remotely. We all have laptops and we all do work from home uh, certain days of the week. And that is very helpful in that it saves a lot of commuting time because um, even people who work just around Boston, often it takes them an hour or so to get in because of traffic and so forth. Uh, it saves money. And <clears throat> I think it taps into a certain type of person that, um, that may not be available or, or want to, to go to some, some of the bigger firms that are in Boston. So uh, we've been very successful in getting talented um, young people who, um, who kind of fit this role. And uh, one area we tapped into, uh, I think, we're, in particular, were stay-at-home moms or, or moms that were out of the workforce for a while and um, were trying to get back in. I can say this personally. My wife was a stay-at-home mom. She's an architect. She was out of the workforce for about 10 years. And uh, I was amazed at how difficult it was for her to get back in. I mean, she had the same experience, um, you know, the, the same education and everything. But it, it, just that 10-year gap, I, I don't know, scared scared people or something. So I think, you know, there's a lot of good talent kind of sitting on the sidelines, good people. And we were able to tap into that. Some people work 40 hours, but others work 32, 24. Um, but I, I think one of the, the, the pieces that makes all of this work is the fact on every Monday, we get together in the office and we have um, a staff meeting as you know, every person there meets. And we map out the week so that when people come and go, everybody is aware of, of what the other person on the team is doing. We use tools that, you know, maybe five or, or more years ago weren't that common. Uh, go to meeting as an example that now are just totally integrated. Most clients use them and we're able to, to communicate um, with these with these tools. And um, I think communication is really key in, in uh you know, making this effective. Now, one of the one of the the benefits of this is that when you have people working remotely and coming and going, you don't need quite as much office space. And in, in a city like Boston, that's very important. So uh, instead of having a very large office footprint, we were able to shrink a bit and have uh, flexible meeting rooms, touchdown spaces, and obviously lower the overhead. 
and uh, you know, therefore the multiplier. So I, I, this all kind of trickles down when uh, we're putting proposals together. It just makes us a little more competitive in, in that regard. Um, so, what are your primary roles as a principal in the company? So my primary role is um, sort of senior project management. So um, I tend to run projects sort of at a, um, try to run them at a higher level, try to help out with the overall, uh, the management um, support Diana and Coos, who are the founders, Diana Nicholas and Coos Lowe, who founded the, uh, the office three years ago. Um, you know, support them with the billing, with the strategy, the proposals, um, and um, yeah, you know, help with staffing needs and so forth. You've talked about some of the advantages of having a uh, kind of a, a dispersed on loca- you know, kind of a, a virtual model in, in terms of allowing some of your staff to do that. And we'll dive into that a bit more. What is difficult, have you found to be difficult or challenging about that model? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, I think that model works at so many levels, but it's really communication based. It's really based on understanding people's schedules, people understanding other people's schedules, being on top of that. I think this is the type of system where it could it could break down very easily if people aren't uh, filling out their calendar, letting other people know what they're up to. Um, if someone has a, you know, is working from home and they have a, a, an appointment, a doctor's appointment, that needs to get out there. You know, it, it's just, it's really as simple as communicating, being available even when you have the appointment sometimes. Um, so, you know, there are instances where um, people have to change their schedule, which is fine because I think the people we have uh, realize that that's part of this strategy and, and approach but um yeah you can i think <laughs> you can understand where uh if someone goes missing suddenly for some reason it uh it can break down pretty easily so so what systems and processes do you have in place to help that communication make sure it happens yeah so we uh we have skype which we use heavily um it, we we rely on you know the old method of the phone and the um Email, but we also uh, encourage people to not only come in on the Mondays, but may, another day, whether it be Wednesday or Thursday, come up and have face-to-face meetings and really try to, to get a lot accomplished in those meetings so that um, we want to minimize the amount of sort of the back and forth remotely. Go-to meeting is great. Um, you know, I, I think whether it's go-to meeting or with Skype, we can we can share things graphically, which is important for us. That's the way... Um, one way we operate, but we also are able with GoToMeeting to bring in clients and we'll often have uh, client meetings, presentations, design updates where, you know, none of us are in a room together. And um, we've gotten to the point at, at first, I think that's a little uh, challenging. You know, it's it's sort of a mindset, but once you get into it and you understand how to operate the software, uh, be prepared and walk people through um, it's, it's fine. It's, it's no different than just sitting, it's sitting in a building, you know, so. I can imagine that it'd be, it's one thing to say, Hey, everybody got to make sure you let us know when you have a doctor's appointment, if you're going to be taking vacation, if you're going to be gone. Uh, it's another thing to actually make sure they do that. How do you instill that culture of communication? Cause ultimately I would imagine it comes down to people actually obeying and following the process and the culture of the firm. <clears throat> Yeah. So, um, you know, part of it goes back to this Monday meeting where we don't just talk about projects, we talk about people. And I think that's an important uh, dif- differentiation here because it, uh, another firm that I had been at, you know, we, were, we dove into the numbers of projects and the schedule and so forth, but uh, deliverables, what was due every week. But I think with us, we talk about people, we talk about what's going on in each other's lives, and we get an under, a brief understanding, at least an overview of what's coming up each week, not just for their tasks, uh, but f- for what they need to do personally. And I think so that's a good way just to get a sense of what's going on. 
Um, it's a reminder to people to kind of when you leave that meeting, update your calendar accordingly. And I have to say it works pretty well. I, um, you know, it's it's a it's a rare it's a, it's rare for uh, for me not to be able to get a hold of someone. And we have Skype on our phones even, uh, which is which is quite nice. I know I'm, I sound like I'm trying to sell something here, but it, it, it all works. It all works well. So. Well, I'm, I'm diving in on this aspect of your business because it is pretty unique. And so that's why my questions are kind of focused around this model because, it, you know, I think I've heard of more firms doing this. And we, we know, you and I, look, we're, you're on the East Coast. I'm here on the West Coast. We're having this conversation. And we know that Fortune 500 companies are out there. I mean, I even heard recently that IBM is shutting down some of the corporate offices and they're going to move to kind of letting people to work out of their own homes, like that kind of flexibility. So it's definitely... I think it's the wave of the future. And going back to these meetings, so I'm curious about how you, uh, you're, you guys are obviously innovating, you're kind of breaking new territory with this particular style of, of office and um, having these elements, I guess, this flexibility that you're offering to your team members. So let's, let's talk about this meeting because you've honed in on this meeting as being kind of one of the primary things that allows the communication to happen. Do you have, what's your set agenda for this meeting? How do you structure that? How, do, how long do the meetings generally take? Walk me through that. So it's usually, an, yeah, so it's usually an hour meeting and, um, you know, we do structure it with a sort of a spreadsheet where we have every project uh, going along the top and every person going along the side. And um, we kind of use the project as a springboard to talk about sort of briefly what's going on and get into the task. But when we do get to each person involved in in a project, we do uh, dig a bit deeper and, and just get an understanding of how they can, uh, you know, how they fit into the project schedule and how the project schedule fits into their schedule. Um, so again, we're able to kind of uh, very easily just talk through personal issues, project issues. But I also have to mention uh, on Mondays, we also have what we call beer hour at the end of the day. And what happens then is we'll just sit at sort of our breakout space table, um, depending on people's schedules, most of us come and go, but we, we, we're able to sit there, have a beer or whatever, uh, something, and just more importantly, just have a chat that's different than the f- more formal meeting. And I think that's an, that's an important follow-up because we do know that Monday is the day that everyone is there. So it's another way to kind of um, hear more about people and 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 hear uh, you know between the lines and, and understand them a bit more and it and it really plays into our culture again we've provided all this flexibility yet everyone really wants to be there because everybody likes each other so um, it's just another piece of it's not forced communication but it's opportunity to to um, to communicate at a maybe a deeper level or um, and I think after that Monday, again, we're really set for the week. Um, everybody kind of has their, their their mindset of what they need to do, and uh, and it works pretty well after that. And of course, during the week, we we still see each other. You know, it it's just it varies. And are these are these meetings conducted virtually, or does everyone go to the central location and meet face to face? Yeah, on Mondays, it's it's. Um, it's almost never virtu- virtual unless you have sort of a client meeting or a site meeting where you couldn't make it. But um, I think, you know, in my I know a lot of people that work remotely and I know some people who work entirely remotely. Um, I would find that difficult personally. I think that um, uh, maybe this is still a bit old fashioned thinking on my part, but I, I think having a bit of face to face is, is, is a good way to kind of connect and, and um, clarify things and uh, make sure that nothing is dropped going down down the road. And I think uh, culturally it's important. Um, you know, I think keeping, it, you're able to keep a certain connection that's different than just seeing somebody on the screen all the time and uh, you speak differently, you, you have other opportunities. So uh, again, I think it reinforces a culture that um, really benefits our office in particular yeah, in the long run. It's easy to have meetings go off track because it's really easy to drill into different issues, especially when you're talking about projects, just let the conversation go off. And so how do you keep those meetings to an hour and make sure that you're discussing the things that's, that are going to move everything forward in the way you need? 
Yeah, you know, sometimes these meetings, you're right, they, it's easy for them to go off track and listen to someone talk about a door changing, you know, or some other minor detail that maybe the whole office doesn't need to hear. But at the same token, when not everybody is in the office all the time every week, uh, it is good to let it go off course sometimes. Because when you, when people are in the office all the time, you're overhearing things. You're always, you, you tend to know about other projects. And you, and you tend to learn about the details and the challenges and so forth. And I think that when you have this meeting, it's a great opportunity to pick up a little, some of these pieces and here's what's important. It may not be, you know, uh, necessarily uh, important to the whole office, but you know, again, it, we're maybe compensating a little bit for the fact that we're not getting that all the time um, because we're not always there. So it's a balance. And I think we've worked it out. You know, you, you become, in, in, I don't know, intuitive of when to kind of let a conversation run a little bit and kind of cut it back at, at other times. So, What technology tools do you use to allow people to have some sort of a chat room or using any sort of chat application, group messaging application so that everyone can see updates you know, um, I'm not a tech guy, so <laughs> I hit my, lim- my limitations here, but um, we try to keep it simple but effective. And for me, as I mentioned earlier, I think um, Skype's been great. I think, you know, what's offered on there, we're able to have group chats, we're able to have video chats, we're able to share graphics. Um, in a lot of ways, for me, that's sort of kind of um, all I need. The go-to meeting, of course, is great when we have a bigger audience and and we have more formal presentation. That works fine. Uh, But we tend to, with Skype, um, you know, just we just chat. Uh, We have pop-up messages going all the time. So I think it works just with those basic tools for me. Now, are there other tools in the office that other people use? Probably. Um, I'm not sure I'm the guy to, you know, get into that. But um, we, we don't seem to have a need uh, at the moment to add more things. We've tried to keep it simple and effective. So, And what are, so let's dive into some of the benefits. Uh, you talked a little bit about the challenges. What are some of the benefits of adding in this kind of virtual office model to the structure of the firm? Yeah, you know, um, well, just when you mentioned benefits, you know, some things just jump to mind. And one is the, the, the no office hours, which I, I think is so sensible because, you know, there are times there you may have meetings at seven in the morning. There may be times where you want to do meeting minutes at nine at night or whatever. Um, I think the office hours are simply defined by the person understanding what their obligations are when they need to meet a client. That's sort of the driver when they need to meet with the team. And if the team decides when those hours are, then so be it. So I think that's number one for me. That's like a fundamental, that's something Coos and Diana came up with, um, you know, right off the bat, that that, that's the way that this office is going to operate. And everybody understands it and it works well. Number two is um, when we we talk to people, uh, potential new hires, uh, we always talk about the unlimited vacation, which for me was a very foreign concept. And at first hard to get my mind around quite frankly but you know it works really well in the sense that um, I think we find that people don't take as much as you would expect they're very responsible with with that um, they take it seriously this this uh, opportunity and I think it also gives a the benefit uh, you can argue this either way but like if I were to go to Florida to visit my parents for instance you know, I'll take my computer and I have the opportunity to do some work, to still meet a little bit at my, um, uh, sort of at my option at, at, based on my schedule. Or if I did have a client meeting, I could still do that. So um, it, it's really mingling or blending the worlds of your personal life a little bit and your work life, which maybe at first blush seems uh, <laughs> potentially you know, horrible, but uh, I think it works well because at the at the end of the day, you or the staff member is in control of it for the most part. Okay. And uh, regarding the unlimited vacation, is that paid vacation or unpaid vacation? 
It's paid. Um, so if you need to take time off or you want to take time off or you want to take a vacation, it's paid. Um, again, there may, it's a two way street. There may be a, a, you know, an afternoon where you have a meeting, uh, but you're sitting in a cafe in Los Angeles, but <laughs> you do the meeting and, uh, there's sort of no questions asked. We also shut the office down between, uh, Christmas and New Year's because we find that, uh, and I, I don't think this is going to shock anyone, but, you know, people, would show up. We noticed when we worked at our other firms, people would show up because they kind of had to show up. But let's face it, not a lot's getting done. And quite frankly, it's a lot better to let someone just go away for a week and not pretend that they're sitting there trying to get something done. And they come back much more refreshed. It's a more honest approach, I think. So um, anyways, that's that's an, another option or, or opportunity that we provide. Now, what does Psalm architecture mean? Tell me about the meaning of the name and, and how that might relate to the culture of the business. Yeah, so Psalm is uh, African. So one of the founders, Kuslo, is uh, South African. And um, it, it means together. So uh, I, think, I think it's very meaningful and, and it really kind of permeates everything we're about. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're um, we're in this together. Um, I think we. Yeah, I lost my train of thought on that one. But, anyways, it means together. So, and people uh, often have problems with it, whether it's Sam or, you know, not knowing what to make of it. But. Yeah. Well, from an outsider, the reason I ask is because it sounds like the firm's culture is very much based around the people. Yeah, it, it is based around the people. Again, um, you know, it's a very low ego place. I think we kind of get a sense. You can tell even at interviews of people who may get this concept and, and appreciate it immediately. And it doesn't mean that they've worked this way in the past. I think it means that they're willing to accept it and um, embrace it. You know, for example, one of the, one of the things that we always tell people: we don't have an office phone per se. We don't have like a, a traditional office phone sitting on the desk or or someone to answer it. We each have our own cell phones, and you come into some knowing you're going to have your cell phone. Your number goes on your card or on your email at the bottom of your email, and that's how people get a hold of you. Uh, again, it's part of this sort of this interwovenness of your life and the office, but the ability to kind of um, manage that. So, uh, but I, I think with that, uh, we've been able to, to kind of join up with people that um, are really, we're all heading in the same direction here. You know, SOM is actually a, um, what we call in the Northeast, a WBE, a woman business enterprise. Um, and um, we really, kind of um, hit the, the meaning of it in the sense that we're 80% women at the, at, at the moment. And again, I think a lot of this goes back to what I said earlier with the, the, the just allowing all of this flexibility. We're tapping into something that I think people maybe didn't realize was out there or, or because it wasn't out there. And I think with that, we're getting so much talent, so much just great people to, to work with. It's, it's been amazing. So. And on the business side of the business, what are some things right now that are working really well for you that you got that you've discovered and that you've seen in the business that you think would be beneficial for other practice owners? Well, again, I think, um, you know, anytime you can lower your overhead, lower your multiplier, you become more competitive. Let's face it, it's, you know, 90% or so of the uh, proposals that go out are are uh, cost driven. You know, we do, we, we go after public work and uh, although it's uh, a quality based selection, cost is always a factor. So with this flexibility, we've been able to keep costs down. Um, you know, we don't have a phone system. We don't, we, you're able to have a smaller footprint. With that multiplier down, we're able to be very competitive. And, and also, with the, the type of people we've gotten, some of them are people we've worked with at Bird Hill, um, similar mindset. But 
we've been able to be very flexible and nimble and adapt. And again, I think I mentioned earlier, we're not, we don't, we're not sector based. We're not healthcare. We're not higher ed necessarily, but, but we do projects in, in many sectors and we do them well. And, um, we were able, because some, we were able to bring some of the people from our former firm with us, um, clients also followed. So I think that happens when you're able to attract, uh, you know, sort of talented um, people with with good work histories and good relationships. The lower overhead you have, you said you're able to come in more competitively for some of these proposals. Um, does that savings, does that influence the profit margin that you guys are taking as a company? How does that affect that? Oh, God. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, you have to realize when you come in with the lower fee and you get the job, you have the lower fee. So <laughs> you got to manage that. It's the, you know, it's not it's not always like winning the lottery when you win some of these, especially public projects, let's be honest. So, um, you know, I think it's you still have to manage these things very tightly. Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, it certainly helps the bottom line. Uh, when when you have this, when you have this structure, I'm just trying to think of some specific examples uh, right off right off the top of my head. I think um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. But uh, anyways, well, maybe you'll think of something um, before we uh, before we finish up here. But you know, with regarding yeah. keeping that that type schedule, where you have to keep these projects on track. I think that's something that anyone listening to the podcast today will definitely identify with. It's always a challenge to keep that scope creep from happening, to make sure that project deadlines are being met, that client demands aren't causing things to slip and not being coordinated properly. So how what how do you guys, what's your process in the firm for delivering that level of service? Yeah. That's a good one, actually. So again, and it goes back to sort of the theme here of the, the flexibility and the way we operate, whereas, um, you know, you don't need to get to the office the next morning at 930 or 10 and have a meeting to discuss something. It, it Everything's live. And, you know, not to say that we give up our evenings, but we're all available um, off hours. And, you know, we know when and when not to bother somebody. So, um Basically, I guess my point is that uh, when things come up and they often come up af- after hours at the end of the day, we just we adapt and, and we deal with them immediately. And as a team and again, with that with that close communication, we're able to do that. And I think, you know, these tight schedules, um, we're able to, to meet them because of that. That's one big factor. Whereas at a bigger firm, you know, you'd have to book a conference room, you'd have to wait for certain people to come in. And, you know, this adds up over time, over the weeks, it, it just it, it eats into the schedule of the project. Um, and I think the tighter you can keep these projects, if you keep them on schedule, keep them ahead of schedule, which is actually possible. And we do that. Uh, of course, that affects the fee. And, um, you know, it, it does it, it does pay dividends to uh, to be nimble and, and to be responsive in that way. Also, I, I think another important thing to mention here is we don't have a, a very strict hierarchy. I mean, we do have titles, uh, but um, we are also flexible in our roles so that, for instance, if we had a project where you have a traditional project manager, project architect, job captain, so on and so forth, we can be flexible in the sense that um, you know, there may be days where the, the project architect goes and acts as the project manager, goes to meetings, takes the notes. So, again, you need a certain sort of mindset to do that. I think it's the same type of mindset that is open and um, sort of low ego, I guess, is one way to put it, where where there's this flexibility, where no one's going to be upset to, <laughs> that you're stepping on their shoes if they're kind of filling that role at some aspect um, and you fill their role a, another time. So. Uh, that's huge. I think that that's really important because I've been in situations where, you know, you have to kind of go up the chain, go back down the chain, wait for a decision to be made as certain people weigh in. And then that changes thinking. And, you know, that can be a killer. Um, and we try to cut that out by working closely and, and uh, not worrying about uh, the title so much. Of course, everyone has their role, but um, and it has to be defined at some level. But um, you know, we, we do kind of cooperate in that sense. 
So it sounds like the process for keeping these products on track, to me, it sounds pretty organic. Do you have a way to track things to know what the status is? I mean, how, how does that communicate to the team? Does someone just say, hey, look, uh, we're 20% done with design development or yeah, we think we're on track or, you know, how, how does management make sure that people are not falling behind? Yeah, so uh, each uh, team has sort of a spokesperson, a PM, I guess you could uh, traditionally call it, um, who reports back, starting with the Monday meeting, who, who talks about schedule, both immediate schedule, immediate needs, and ongoing schedule, um, where we stand. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's certainly a, a way to kind of get it broadcast out there. Um, we all know when a project is, I don't want to say in trouble, but, uh, something crops up where everybody needs to jump in or, uh, you know, again, we're nimble enough where people can jump from one team to the next. We're small enough at 26 people in the office that we, we do know uh, a little bit about each project. So people are aware of sort of the task and where it stands and we're able to kind of grab people back and forth. And, and again, it's done, not, uh, we don't need to run it up the chain and, and ask command for that to happen. It can be immediate. And, uh, uh, you know, that kind of response is, is uh, helpful and, and, and immediate to, the, to, to solving the problem. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, Ed. I think we've covered some important things about communication, about the, the business model of SOM what you guys are doing that's very interesting, the distributed kind of office environment that you have. Uh, are there any additional business insights that you'd like to share that have been instrumental for you in, in your own career from a business aspect? You know, the only other thing I want to add is uh, it's, been a, it's been a great conversation. And, um, you know, sometimes I don't even think of these things anymore. So it's, it's nice to kind of be forced to, to remember what we're doing here and get it out there. But I also just want to add that I find that clients really like this structure and uh, I'm kind of a little surprised or I was at least at first that uh, they like that flexibility because I think clients are, uh, well, twofold. One is they're trying to be more flexible themselves, I, I believe, at least I've seen that. And th I think they also like the fact that, you know, we're always there, we're always in the background. And um, again, you know, they, they can reach us pretty easily and they don't have to kind of go through uh, a layering of, of management or, or other people to get right to the heart of the people dealing with their issues. So, um, you know, I think the word gets out I th when, when clients are comfortable and they're happy. And I think this is, this is definitely a, a big way to, to get that. Awesome. Okay. Well, hey, this just one last personal question. Uh, has anyone ever told you that they were, they were, uh, that you remind them of, uh, the, the actor Mark Ruffalo? <laughs> uh, you mean the Incredible Hulk? No, yeah. no one's, no, nobody's ever said that. <laughs> well, I, I want to, uh, but, uh, for those okay. of you who are listening, I want you to uh, come over, watch the YouTube version of this. Uh, take a look at, uh, you know, some of Ed's uh, mannerisms and his facial expressions definitely look like it could be close kin. And just don't get him too angry because you never know what could happen. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't like me when I'm angry. So, yes. Awesome. All right. Okay, Ed, thanks for joining so thank us on the you. show. Yep. Okay. That is a wrap. As a podcast listener, get access to my free four-part architecture firm profit map by going to freearchitectgift.com. You can also get it by texting the phrase profit map, that's two words, to the phone number 773-770-4377. Today's podcast is sponsored by AIA Advantage partner BQE Software, the makers of BQE Core. BQE Core is office management software for architecture and design professionals. Get rid of the post-it notes and Excel spreadsheets and get real-time insights on the profitability of your firm with a simple, beautiful, and easy to customize graphical dashboard. Say goodbye to undercharging or ending the year wondering where all that profit went. Core gives you the power you need to grow your firm. Learn more and get a free trial over at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.